Bueno, pues buenos días a todos los que estáis aquí en la sala, los que estáis conectados por streaming. Eh, para mí es un placer poder presentar a Richard Hastings. Eh, cuando yo inicié mi tesis doctoral en el año 2002, que era sobre el tema de la, de la adaptación psicológica de la familia, pues empecé a buscar información, a leer artículos y, y eran los artículos de Hastings los, los más relevantes porque era el pionero en ese, en ese ámbito. ¿no? Él eh, ya en ese año, en el 2002, hacía investigaciones sobre el bienestar psicológico de las familias, el estrés, la ansiedad, eh, eh, ver aquellos factores que podían estar también influyendo en, en, en una mejor adaptación, los problemas de conducta, cómo podían impactar también en esa eh, salud mental de la familia. Eh, también fue pionero en marcar pues, aspectos positivos como las percepciones positivas o las contribuciones positivas que aportan un niño a la familia, no un niño con a la familia, eh, las estrategias de afrontamiento. O sea, yo cuando leí sus artículos, la verdad que, que se me abrió un campo pues, muy amplio de, de posibilidades, de, de variables, de, 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 digo, quiero, quiero ir por ahí. ¿no? Entonces, en el año 2005 tuve la posibilidad de tener un, pues, una beca para ir a hacer una estancia y pues, directamente... Con quien contacté fue con Richard Hastings, que no me puso ninguna pega y me dijo, vale, pues vente para acá. Y allí que me fui. Mi problema era el inglés, claro, que yo me lancé y yo soy de otra generación que prácticamente, pues bueno, pues el bachillerato lo hice de francés, pero y me arriesgué allí, me fui. Y la verdad es que es una, fue una experiencia muy, muy interesante, muy, porque no solamente ya a nivel profesional, todo lo que aprendí, sino también con su equipo de trabajo eh, y la cercanía, y, y eso pues lo voy a llevar siempre, ¿no?, de, de todos ellos. Richard Hastings, como digo, fue pionero en todo este ámbito, no solamente del autismo, sino también de la discapacidad intelectual, de otras discapacidades en el desarrollo. Y bueno, pues desde aquellos momentos hasta ahora, su producción científica eh, ha ido creciendo exponencialmente porque... Bueno, pues tiene mucha gente a su alrededor a la que forma y, y grandes investigadores. De hecho, si a lo mejor os metéis en el Google académico, pues podéis ver la gran cantidad de citas que tienen todos sus trabajos, eh, la grande, el gran número de publicaciones. Por ejemplo, yo he eh, curioseado un poco, digo, voy a ver en el año 2022, pues 40 publicaciones. Eh, entonces, bueno, es eh, pues un pionero y un gran experto en todo este ámbito. Eh, actualmente está en la Universidad de Warwick y, bueno, pues es catedrático de allí, de, la, de una cátedra, de la cátedra CEDAR, de, que es de investigación familiar en el Centro de Evaluación e Investigación del Desarrollo Educativo. Y, bueno, pues es un placer contar con él. Muchas gracias, Richard, por haber aceptado venir aquí y, y sobre todo, el esfuerzo de venir ayer, irte hoy, o sea… Para nosotros, para Etapi, es un placer que, que estés compartiendo este tiempo con nosotros. Y bueno, pues cuando quieras puedes comenzar. Thank you, Pilar, for your kind introduction. And um, in recognition that you were in North Wales with me for a little while, it's only... I've still got one minute to say Borada, everyone, which is good morning in Welsh and probably closer, I think, to good morning in Spanish than it is in English. So, Borada. And thank you very much for the invitation to come to talk to you today. So, I'm going to talk about stress and psychological well being in families of children with autism. I hope by the end of the presentation, at least, I'll have made you think a little bit differently about family research in the field of autism. I also help, hope that I'll have made you think a little bit differently how, about how we can best support families. But perhaps most importantly, I want to try to show you, convince you that the challenges that families face are not necessarily about the child's autism all the time, but they are about other things, other things that all of us um, are able to help to change for the better. 
So when I am talking about families today, I recognize that families come in many shapes and sizes. So who is part of a person's and individual's family is defined by them. It's up to them who they decide is part of their family. We can't define that for them. But what, whatever family looks like to you, um, to individuals with autism, it's often helpful to think of families as systems. And family systems theory suggests that family members are interdependent. So that essentially means they influence each other. Their well-being, their outcomes for individual family members are influenced by other members of the family, other individual members of the family, but the well-being of an individual is also influenced by other subsystems within the family. So every family probably has a number of different subsystems within it. So in many families there may be um, two adults who are partners together, so there's a couple subsystem, a couple relationship. There may be other children, so the children in the family have a sibling relationship. The parent has a relationship with one child um, and with another child. So there are all those subsystems as well within a family. So family systems theories are really about the fact that all of those individuals in the family, but also all those subsystems, will affect each other. And so there has been a real interest um, over the years in families of children with autism and how they might be affected by raising a child who has an autistic condition. And that's probably because we recognise that uh, autistic individuals face a number of challenges um, in life and so we might expect that that's, ha that has some implications for the family. But of course if we think from a family systems point of view and some of Jonathan Green's presentation is directly related to this as well, um, the well-being and the actions, the behaviours of other family members will also affect um, children with autism in the family. Jonathan showed how you know, changing some element of the way that the parent interacts with the child has implications for the child's development. So it's not just that the child influences the family. The family is clearly a really important context for the development of autistic children. So that's kind of setting the scene a little bit. When we look, though, in the popular media, um, on news sites, on the internet, even on internet sites that perhaps attend, are intending to be helpful to families of autistic children, actually they tend to paint a very grim picture of life um, as a family um, of an autistic child. I've just selected a few um, copies of reports, books, um, internet stories on this slide from a set of um, uh, sort of international English language sort of websites. So we see reports like we have in the UK about um, couples who raised disabled children, including autistic children, being under pressure. Um, we see families writing about the isolation that they feel as a parent um, and family of a child um, with disability seen headlines in, in um, websites in the United States about, that's why it says autistic moms, because it's a um, US website, but mothers of, of autistic children having stress levels similar to that of combat soldiers. I'm not quite sure why that's the best comparison, um, but presumably it's a sort of sensationalist way to indicate how much stress um, families um, of children with autism might be under. And even on sort of helpful websites, that um, picture in the bottom right there is, is a sort of set of questions you might ask yourself if you were a carer of a disabled person about whether you're suffering from carer burnout, a number of indicators of carer burnout. So most of what we see and what families see then day to day is quite negatively phrased, um, quite grim in terms of its picture of what family life might be like. But I want to explore in this presentation really how much of this negative narrative, this sort of way of talking about families in quite a negative way, is actually borne out by the research evidence, or in what ways it might and might not be. And of course, there are lots and lots of research studies internationally um, in just about any country you can think of that show that if you compare 
um, stress in parents or mental health in parents of autistic children with that um, well-being stress, mental health of parents of other children, then you usually see higher levels of stress, more mental health difficulties, higher level, uh, lower levels of well-being in parents of autistic children than you do in other parents. So we see that lots of times. But there are a number of biases in that research literature. Often those studies are very small. They contain too few people to really draw very strong conclusions. We also have the problem of whether the um, samples studied are representative of families who have an autistic child. Maybe those who have fewer problems as family members are more likely to participate in research. Equally, maybe, um, family members who are facing significant levels of stress are much more likely to take part in research because they want to tell people about it. We don't really know, but the key thing is that likely we're not capturing a representative group of families of autistic children. If we're making comparisons with other parents, other families, to see that difference um, that impacts on families of autistic children, then we also have the problem of whether the comparison group um, are representative as well of other families in the same sort of way. Why do they take part in research? We also sometimes have the problem of you know, knowing actually that the families involved in research are caring for an autistic child. It's often based on them responding to a survey that's for those families, but it's often quite difficult to check um, that those families do indeed have an autistic child. And of course, in research, we have another sort of bias that we might refer to as the file draw problem, which is people are much more likely to publish studies where they find interesting differences. So perhaps the fact that we've seen all these studies that suggest there are differences between families of autistic children and those uh, other families, um, we see those differences because that's what people found. And when they didn't find differences, they didn't publish those studies. So it's helpful to have a look at studies that help to reduce um, many or all of these biases in research and so give us a, perhaps a better indication of how um, the members of families um, of autistic children are doing compared to other families. And I want to share with you some data um, that's quite old now. I hope you'll forgive me um, for presenting data that are quite old because I think they clearly give us a sense of what might be going on. So I'm going to talk about some data from the UK Office for National Statistics, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Surveys that actually were carried out in 1999 and 2004. Um, so that's why they're a bit old. But over 18,000 children between 5 and 16 years of age um, were included in these surveys, these two surveys together. About half of them were boys, and it was a population-based sample across the UK. So it does represent the UK uh, population of children, young people, and their families. And it had a high response rate, so that was good too. Now, within that sample, um, the reason I'm using these data still to illustrate the points I want to make is that it's possible within that sample to identify both a group of children who have uh, probably have autism and a group of children who have intellectual disability and who have the two conditions. So my colleague Eric Emerson in Lancaster University identified a group um, of young people within those surveys who likely had an intellectual disability based on a number of indicators including whether they attended special schools or had special supports for um, their intellectual disability. Um, and then also um, during this study, um, a clinical interview was carried out with all of the children, young people, or, or with their families, um, or both. And so there were 98 children in this overall sample who met the clinical criteria for the diagnosis of autism. Um, and so this isn't based on parent report, but on the basis of um, a screening and interview during the course of the surveys. And so um, my colleague Vasa Totsik, who's now at University College London, who was at Bangor when um, Pilar was visiting, um, carried out a four-group comparison of families. So those um, who did not have a child with either autism or intellectual disability, those who had intellectual disability alone, those who had 
um, an autistic condition alone and those who had autism and intellectual disability. So those three disability groups being compared to um, the controls or comparison. And this is the main summary I'd like to show you of the overall data in relation to sort of family outcomes because uh, family members res responding to the survey were also asked about their own well-being, their own psychological well-being. And in this case, these data on this graph, which I'll explain in a moment, are taken from the general health questionnaire, the GHQ 12-item um, version. And so this is the percentage of mothers of children in each of those four groups that I explained who meet the cutoff on the GHQ 12 for potential emotional disorder. Very negatively phrased thing, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But let's look at the comparison. So I'd like you to notice a few things. Um, first, we do get what we might have expected from the previous literature. So if you look at the difference between the three disability groups and the control group of families, or mothers in this case, um, the disability groups are one and a half to two times more likely to have mothers who report high levels of emotional or, or likely emotional disorder, shall we say. That's highest um, in the two autism groups. But the three disability groups certainly differ from the control group. So we, we replicate that finding that we would have expected to see. The other thing, though, that I'd like you to notice from the graph is that that y-axis going up upwards on the left-hand side there is the percentage of mothers in each of the groups that meet this criteria for emotional disorder. So you should notice that the graph bars only go as high as just over 40%. So more than half of the mothers in each of the study groups, including the two autism groups and the intellectual disability group, did not have a high level of emotional disorder symptoms. A good number of them do, and that's a reality we have to think about and support, but the majority did not. So let's have a look at and think about fathers in families of autistic children as well. And I'm going to um, just show you some data from um, a study that Seymour and colleagues carried out on the longitudinal study of Australian children. Now, this was, again, a population-based um, design. Um, they looked at data when children were eight to nine years of, old, of age, and they looked at the well-being of fathers who had a child with autism and fathers who did not have a child with autism. Now, I've put that information on there about that 97% of the fathers um, who had a child with autism were in paid employment and 99% were living in two-parent families. Just because I wanted to point out that the data in this, or the samples in this study may not be representative of Australian families um, more widely. So there's something going on with um, which fathers responded to this survey that means perhaps it loses its representativeness a bit but let's put that aside. Autism um, was self-reported by parents. It was not an independent assessment of autism as part of the study this time. And this time, father's psychological distress was measured using a measure called the Kessler 6. So it is a measure of psychological distress. So here's the results. So the fathers of children with autism are the red bars, and the fathers who did not have a child with autism are the green bars. And there's two different ways of scoring the Kessler 6. One is whether um, people are scoring in the clinical range, which is obviously a higher criterion, and one whether people are kind of generally symptomatic of having some difficulties. So the left-hand side of the graph is the clinical range data, which is why the bars are lower, a smaller proportion, and the right-hand side, the symptomatic. But basically, fathers are between nearly two times and four times more likely to have concerning levels of psychological distress, depending on which of the criteria you use, um, if they have an autistic child compared to other fathers. So again, we're replicating that finding that we've seen across many studies about how families of children with autism might differ uh, from other families. But again, though, take a look at the left-hand side of the graph. So, um, the scale on the left, the y-axis again going up there, is again about the percentage of each group who meet these criteria. And it only goes up um, to 14. So 14% 14 
of fathers of children with autism had symptomatic levels of um, psychological distress and only about 3% had that sort of clinical level. So the vast majority of fathers of autistic children in this study do not have significant levels of psychological distress, but they are much more likely than other fathers to have those high levels of psychological distress. So exactly the same thing as we saw for mothers in the data I just showed you. And of course, you know, we, we often have a mother, we sometimes have fathers, or often have fathers in families. We have other adults as well. And often there are other children in the family. So there's a question about, are um, the siblings of autistic children um, any different than other siblings in terms of their psychological outcomes? And this time, I thought I'd just summarize for you some data from a meta-analytic study. So looking internationally um, at studies that are compared siblings of children with, with autism, si yes, siblings of, who had brothers or sisters with autism, if you like, um, compared to children who did not have brothers and sisters with autism. And so this is Carolyn Shivers's uh, meta-analysis published in 2019. And there were lots of different outcomes that they looked at in this study, but for sort of overall psychological functioning, there was a small effect size difference overall across all of the studies between um, autism siblings and those who did not have a brother or sister with autism. It's a small effect, uh, but a small significant effect. Um, Hedges G there of 0.26. And I've also just given you information about a couple of the different outcomes. So for internalizing problems, the effect was slightly larger, but still um, significant and still relatively small. But for externalizing behavior problems, though, there was no evidence of a difference between um, young people who had a brother or sister with autism and young people who did not have a brother or sister with autism. That's a not a significant difference and a very tiny group difference there on externalizing behavior problems. So it does depend a little bit on what outcomes you measure as well when we try to understand families. But we're seeing perhaps some evidence of some small difference between autism siblings and others. And in terms of following up on siblings, I wanted to share with you some data from um, some PhD research that one of my PhD students, Mike Patalis, did um, when I was in Bangor University. Um, and we did a kind of relatively large autism family study and collected data about mothers, data about fathers, data about siblings. And in terms of siblings, we asked mothers, fathers, and siblings themselves to report on the well-being of the siblings in the family. So we've got some kind of um, multi-informant data, if you like. And I just want to show you some graphs from different perspectives that illustrate something, I think, important about how we think about whether siblings are influenced when they're in a family of um, a child with autism. So first of all here, here's um, the reports that, uh, of mothers of children who were siblings of those with autism. 168 of them, and they completed the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, the SDQ, uh, which you might be familiar with. And here on this graph, in the red lines, are the overall percentage of the um, siblings of children with autism who were in the clinical range on each of the scores on the SDQ. So going from left to right, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity, peer problems, pro-social behavior, so lower levels of pro-social behavior are um, seen as problematic, high levels are seen as positive, of course, and the overall total difficulties on the SDQ made up of the first four problem scales. And the yellow bars are um, normative data from UK children. So it's not, we didn't recruit a control group here, these are just a comparison with normative data. So what you can see, hopefully, quite clearly, um, is that we do see group differences. There are significant differences in terms of the proportion of siblings in families of children with autism who have um, potentially higher levels of conduct problems, emotional problems, um, lower levels of pro-social behavior, and um, higher levels of total difficulties. But they don't differ, the two groups, on hyperactivity and on peer problems. Now, these are the data reported by mothers. So the other thing to notice is to look at that left-hand side again, that y-axis going up the side. So that, that's the, remember, the percentage of children in the two groups that meet these 
clinical cutoff criteria on the SDQ. Note that it doesn't get higher than just over 25%. So the vast majority, again, of siblings in families of children with autism might not be experiencing significant levels of uh, problems, but they are experiencing probably more problems, as reported by mothers, um, than other young children or young people. Now, I've, I've kept the scale of these graphs exactly the same, but I'm going to move to show you um, now what the fathers reported on the same measure, the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. They also completed the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire about the sibling in the family. Now, one of the things you'll notice, hopefully, as soon as I move the slide, is that the bars drop downwards. So if you ask fathers, they see fewer problems overall in their uh, siblings in the family than do mothers. There is a clear difference. It makes a difference who you ask in the family, what they tell you then about how siblings are doing. And again, if you notice, um, there are some group differences. So there are, in terms of the normative data, so there's higher levels of emotional problems and lower levels of pro-social behavior in the um, siblings who have children with autism. Um, but also notice again um, that it's only just over 15% or so that's the highest level of problems in the autism siblings group. So the vast majority, according to father's ratings again, of siblings don't have problems in the clinical range. And now I'm going to switch to... Now these are not exactly the same um, families, because notice we went from 168 mothers to 130 fathers, so some are missing. And then when I show you the sibling self-reports on the next graph, this is only for those who were age 11 or older in the study, so it reduces the number again. So it's not a direct comparison with these other graphs, but I think it does illustrate um, the point I'm trying to make. So again, watch what happens to um, the bars on the graph when I move from fathers to self-reports from young uh, siblings themselves. So it goes lower again. And actually, in terms of the difference from the normative data, the sample is smaller, so maybe there are um, some problems with sample size here. But actually, the siblings themselves um, thought that they had more problems with their peers or peer-related problems than normative um, data but they didn't really see themselves, at least statistically significantly anyway in this study, as different on the other domains. So they specified the problems for them uh, was with their peers. And again, notice the left-hand side, you know, the vast majority of siblings, again, are not reporting they've got significant levels of difficulties. So it matters who you ask in families about how families are doing. You will get a different answer if you ask mothers about how they're doing than if you ask fathers. And if you ask about siblings, again, it makes a big difference who you ask. Mothers are perhaps reporting more problems in their siblings, fathers slightly less so, siblings themselves even less so. And that's important, I think, in terms of um, trying to understand assessment for families as well, that we should take great care to think about who we're asking about how the family is doing and making sure perhaps we get multiple perspectives on that. Now, the data that I've showed you essentially do support the idea that key family members, uh, mothers, fathers, probably siblings as well, do report more psychological problems when they're in a family of an autistic child compared to other mothers, fathers, and siblings. There is that sort of group difference. And I'm not going to go through every single bit of evidence that supports all of these points on this slide, um, because I think you probably want to get to Jackie's presentation and to lunch at some point, and we'd still be here tomorrow if I did. But I hope you will um, stay with me and accept that there is good enough evidence to support each of the points that I'm making here on this slide. So why... Uh, might these family members be experiencing higher levels of, say, stress or psychological uh, problems or lower levels of well-being? And one of the big things is that socioeconomic status or poverty affecting families is a really big factor that we often ignore. 
Um, I imagine it must be the same in Spain, that families of disabled children generally um, are much more likely to be living in poverty um, in the UK um, than other families. And I imagine that's a pattern in other countries too. And this certainly applies to families of autistic children. So that background of poverty is really significant and something we have to take seriously. It's something that drives people's well-being generally. And so it will drive well-being in families of autistic children if they face those additional challenges. Um, one of the most reliable things that's associated with how stressed mothers, fathers, and, and also siblings might say they are in families of autistic children is um, the level of the child with autism's uh, behavior problems. So it's quite specific um, that it appears to be behavior problems are the things that drives family stress rather than, for example, the level of their adaptive skills or cognitive skills or even the level of their or the severity of their autistic behaviors and symptoms. One of the things that clearly drives stress in families as well is the lack of support from services. Health services, social care services, education services. Not just the lack of support, but also problems accessing any health, social care, or, or appropriate expert education services. Also, one of the things that drives stress is that um, the nature of caring or supporting a child or young person with autism in the family typically involves more care hours per week and more daily physical and personal care, especially when that autistic child also has an intellectual disability or other uh, disabilities. And that's compared to other carers who are supporting children or adults. We also face a challenge um, in that families are stressed by other people's attitudes. So there's that impact of affiliate stigma. So being the family member of an autistic child. And for example, seeing those responses out in public when you know, an autistic child might have a meltdown, for example, the response of other people is an incredibly stressful thing for families, perhaps even more so um, than the meltdown itself. Also, families worry, at least in the UK, and I think I've seen similar data in other countries, they worry about what's going to happen to their autistic child um, in the future. When they're no longer at school, when they're no longer able to perhaps care for them. So there's a real worry about ongoing future care. Also, families are typically um, of autistic individuals have less social support available. Their social networks are often smaller, and so they can't draw on that natural social support that helps bolster our, well, our well-being as, as humans. And then I've left it right onto the bottom of the slide um, because I think there's so many of those social and economic factors there that are big things that really affect how well families are doing that it becomes less significant, but it is actually a kind of possibly contributing factor as well. There is possibly a contribution of that broad autism phenotype on... Uh, why individuals in families of autistic people may experience higher levels of stress, more psychological problems. There may be a direct effect that's kind of genetically driven, but also there may be an interactive effect. So uh, perhaps individuals with high levels of that sort of broad autism phenotype may be more sensitive to other life stresses and more impacted by them. But essentially, it's a minor point on a big, long list of very big things. So if those things are the things that are mainly driving um, additional levels of stress in families and individual family members, then what we're facing here, if you look at each of those, there's, there's actually something that we could do about each of those. We could change each of those. And therefore, what family members are probably facing, certainly mothers, probably fathers, and maybe siblings, are probably facing a mental health inequality. So there are those group differences there in their experience. And, but nearly all of the factors that are driving that increased risk of stress, increased risk of psychological problems in family members of autistic individuals, nearly all of those factors are things that we can do something about. They're associated with autism, but they're not specifically necessarily all about um, the autism or its severity. These factors can be changed and improved or fixed with the right support. And that, that combination is the definition of a mental health inequality. It's a group difference that is there, it exists, 
but it's driven by factors that can be changed. Therefore, it's an inequality we can do something about, we can have an impact on. And I think being clear that perhaps stress or other underlying psychological problems in family members of autistic children, if we, if we represent that as an inequality, it brings a slightly different perspective on our responsibility to do something to better support families. I hope that you might see that it does. Pilar mentioned in her introduction, um, and I briefly mentioned it earlier, that um, so far uh, I've presented you data that are about negative outcomes. So negative mental health, um, prob mental health problems, high levels of stress. Um, but of course that's not the whole picture in terms of what family members experience. And I'm going to go back to this graph, so one that you remember. In the same data set, um, there's actually a measure of positive mental health as well. And so we can have a look at how these four groups of mothers differ in terms of their levels of high positive mental health. And these are the green bars I've added in here. There is actually no statistically significant difference between these groups here, although it does look like um, those, especially mothers of autistic children who don't have an intellectual disability, have got slightly lower levels of high positive mental health or are slightly less likely to have high levels of positive mental health. But essentially, there are no meaningful group differences here. And so a substantial minority of all of these mothers of these um, children uh, with disabilities um, also have high levels of positive mental health. So it's not the whole story to focus on problems. It's really important to think about the balance in understanding what families experience as well. So I suppose a little bit of a summary of what we've seen and what I'm trying to kind of get over today, perhaps. So I would argue that the data in research suggest, um, yes, there are real difficulties for families, and we cannot ignore that, and individual families may be in very um, difficult circumstances that we need to understand and we need to support. However, if we look at the whole population of families of autistic children, we need to think a little bit differently about how we describe their experiences and the expectations that we have. Because the majority of parents and siblings of children with autism are not suffering from psychological problems. Mothers of children with autism are probably two to three times more likely, and fathers, you know, about one and a half times more likely, to report worrying levels of psychological distress. So we can't deny that experience, but that overall population level of experience is, uh, paints a slightly different picture. And parents of children with autism, well, I showed you data on mothers, um, also experience and report significant positivity, not just in terms of positive mental health, as I've reported today, but also other perceptions that about the positive impact that their autistic child has had on them individually and as a family, as Pilar mentioned in, in her introduction. So those positive experiences do exist too. Most of the factors that increase, especially parents' psychological distress, but also distress of other family members in, in families of, of children with autism, most of those factors are things that can be changed. They're sort of social, economic, contextual things that we have the ability to do something about. What's also really important to remember in this kind of context, though, is that family stress, family well-being, however you think about it and describe it, whether it's at the whole family level or whether it's about key members of the family, um, high levels of sort of family stress will also have consequences for the psychological well-being, the mental health and the development of autistic children. That's because they're children like all other children and their family is the kind of key context in which they grow up and develop. And if we have high levels of stress in that family, that will influence the child's development as it would for any other child. This is not specific to autism, but it's a recognition that autistic children will be affected in similar ways by what's happening in their family, as will all children. And so we need to take that extremely seriously if we're thinking from that family systems uh, point of view. So in terms of the 
information I've presented today as well, I just wanted to end on a kind of summary of well, what um, can we do to better support families. And I've got, I'm not going to go into lots and lots of detail here, but I'm going to try and make a series of points. Um, so if you go back to my slide of the things that are driving family stress, they're all things that we might need to do something about. So if we're going to better support families, we need multiple interventions designed to support the family as a system and not just individual family members. So basically, there will be no silver bullet. There will be no one single way of approaching this, no one intervention that will make the difference. Rather, we've got to do a whole set of things. So for example, we could work directly to help reduce psychological problems, improve mental health, improve well-being, uh, reduce stress in parents. So we could help them with their stress management, with their coping skills. That might be one of the things we need to do. If children's behaviour problems, and it's not just the autistic child, if we're thinking about a family systems perspective, remember, um, the autistic child may have significant levels of behaviour problems, but also other children in the family might too. So families may well need support in managing those uh, children's difficult behaviour in the context of the family. We also clearly, if we're thinking about the family as a system and how it can support all of its members and subsystems, need to work on strengthening family relationships and building family resilience to kind of cope with the challenges that life will throw at families of autistic children. Services and professionals, though, need to up their game when it comes to being accessible to and supporting in a personalised way um, children, but also their families. So we need to improve that support from, we need to improve consistency of services, and we need to improve knowledge within different service contexts as well um, to make sure there's a more personalised, supportive approach for families. Coming back to the economic issues that I mentioned, we need actually to be helping parents to get into work, uh, paid work, and to stay in work so that their family has income. We also need to work at that sort of public level on, a, on awareness raising, trying to change attitudes and understanding towards autistic children. And because of that uh, public reaction, that affiliate stigma that I talked about. We also need to help families much earlier um, help plan for the future care of their autistic child. And we need to improve social support. And one way of doing that might at the very least be between families of autistic children and other families of autistic children, so parent to parent, but also other social supports. Now, if we do one or two of these things, we will, will, will start to make a difference to the experience of families of children with autism. But if we do all of these things in a coordinated way, offering a comprehensive support, and one that varies depending on the needs of the family across the lifespan as well. And if we co-produce the solutions and supports for families with families, then perhaps we can change the world for families of children with autism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for your presentation. I, I think I have time for questions. Alguna pregunta que queráis hacerle al profesor Richard Hastings? Aquí o los que estáis conectados también en online. No se anima nadie. Bueno, pues yo quería hacerte una pregunta. Sí, ya sé que, que has hecho bueno, pues un resumen al final de, de posibles intervenciones eh, y de aspectos concretos sobre los que, los que incidir. ¿no? Aquí la, la mayoría de las personas que formamos a ETAPI, pues muchas de ellas trabajan en la práctica y, y bueno, pues... Eh, no sé, ¿alguna recomendación más sobre cómo poder llevar esa práctica o a, a sus centros o cómo trabajar? A, si puedes aportarnos alguna 
idea sobre al, alguno de esos aspectos que consideres más relevantes para poder trabajar <risa> de todos los, los trabajos que has hecho. <risa> Is it? Yeah, now it's working. Um, for those of you who didn't hear, I said try to do everything. So I think the, what's important, I suppose, is to recognize that the more of the um, things that drive family stress you're able to do something about, the better. Obviously, do, you being able to do all of the things on my list would be really helpful if services are able to find ways to do that. Um, and so, and you know, s professionals in the field of autism have usually have the set of skills that would be needed to try and help families. So, you know, even if we think about, for example, you know, helping parents to stay in work or um, you know to get work, mm -hmm. um, you're in a position where you might be able to at least advocate for families with the social social systems of support that they have. You know, you'd be knowledgeable about the sort of benefits or social security supports that families might be able to get access to that they may not be aware of. So there's even those relatively simple things that are perhaps information-based um, and that rely on the expertise that you would have about what's available to families that could make a big difference. And those are apart from, you know, the more sort of psychological, for example, supports that mm -hmm. may be offered to families. So um, I talked about kind of stress management, kind of coping, for parents and you know, some of the um, best evidence that we have at the moment um, in terms of interventions that support family carers you know, with a few randomized control trials as well might be um, mindfulness-based supports for families. So there are some sort of candidate interventions as well out there that might address different things. Um, you know, in terms of parent training, there are versions of well-known parent training programs, you know, the Triple P system, the Incredible Years system that have been adapted for families of children with disabilities or in, in case in, of incredible years, um, families of children with autism more specifically. So those kind of things already kind of exist that could be used to address some of these things. And it's mm -hmm. just, I think, offering a coordinated approach to families, but also, I guess, based on what are their most important needs each family has that would be the way, the way to go. I don't know if that answers what you were asking. Y bueno, yo hablo en español. Sí. Es verdad que el estrés es algo que se mantiene en la mayoría de los estudios. Se ve que a lo largo del ciclo vital, pues, es algo que que sigue siendo crónico, ¿no? Pero que es tan importante, yo creo, que trabajar esos aspectos cognitivos de fortalecimiento del sobre todo de, de, del enfoque que tiene sobre cómo te acercas a las situaciones, cómo las percibes, cómo eh, la autoeficacia, por ejemplo, o la autocompetencia, eh, trabajar sobre esa parte tan básica que es fortalecerte, tener unos cimientos fuertes para poder afrontar las distintas situaciones que se plantean que son muchas y muy complicadas eh, a lo largo de la vida ¿no? de, de las familias. Gracias, Richard. Sí, una pregunta por ahí. Quisiera felicitar a, al ponente por esta magistral eh, bueno, eh, disertación. Quisiera realizar alguna pregunta y es la siguiente. Aparte de los métodos de recolección de información basados en autorreporte o en, o en encuestas, ¿existen algunos otros métodos que puedan medir de forma más objetiva esta variable en los padres, si hay estudios que hayan eh, desarrollado este tipo de, de repente, o hayan considerado este tipo de herramientas en sus estudios? Yes. <laughs> so, as, as well as, as self-report, there are certainly examples in the literature of people doing um, some physiological monitoring, but also um, response to, um, sorry, I'm, I'm losing the words now in English. <laughs> um, there are studies that, are, that look at also kind of the body's response to kind of things like vaccine challenge, 
as a way of kind of measuring overall kind of what level of stress um, individuals are under. And so there are a number of studies that use those methods as well. So in research terms, it's possible to kind of look at different methodologies. They give us the same answer, which is that families of, all, of children with autism are um, you know, still experiencing, they're experiencing, if you like, if you measure it more objectively, you, you still see those differences that you get in self-report. So it's not just about families self-reporting. I suppose the challenge in practice is that those methods um, are very difficult to use, very time intensive, expensive, and probably don't give us much extra information than just by asking people and observing what's happening for them in their family too. But yet, yes, very much on the research side, there are some interesting things that can be explored in that respect. Hola. Hola. Buenos días, Dr. Hastings, aquí. Aquí, buenas. Yo quería, bueno, preguntar, no sé si hay experiencias, pero yo una cosa que pienso que a lo mejor podría ir bien para, para disminuir el estrés de las familias, de, de niños con autismo, para mejorar el bienestar emocional, podría ser explicar a, a los niños neurotípicos lo que es el autismo, ¿no? Desde pequeños, a entender mejor a sus compañeros con autismo que están en clase y también a los padres de estos compañeros neurotípicos, ¿no? que cuando estos compañeros neuro, con autismo pegan a sus hijos ¿no? y vas oyendo, este ha pegado a mi hijo y nadie entiende que, que ni sabe, ni sabe muchas veces que este niño tiene un trastorno del espectro del autismo. ¿no? Yo el otro día recibí un mensaje de una madre compañera de mi hija que me decía, bueno, que decía todo el grupo, ¿no? yo soy la madre de tal, no sé si sabéis que, el, que tal es un niño con autismo, ¿no? Y seguro que muchos padres dijeron, ah, este niño que pega es un niño con autismo. Y fueron más empáticos con este niño, ¿no? Si esto se hiciera más y, y si hubiera a lo mejor unas guías, unos apoyos de cómo hacerlo, pues a lo mejor también sería una medida para disminuir este estrés. No sé si ustedes tienen experiencia en esto, si hay alguna manera de hacerlo bien. Gracias. Sí, eso es otro buen punto. Y eso es parte de mi point about on the list of things we need to do is that sort of awareness raising attitude change kind of work. So it probably does start with children and in school context, but it's much bigger than that because it's about society much more widely. So we have done some work and a number of people, um, I think in Scotland, have been um, developing some intervention work as well that I can't remember the name of at the moment, um, so forgive me. But, um, working in schools to in increase children's understanding of difference generally, not necessarily specifically about autism, but to help them to understand difference a bit more generally, um, and directly use um, uh, contact with people who have differences as the way to kind of shift attitudes. So if you're going to shift attitudes, the most evidence-based way to do that is through some kind of direct contact, not just um, you know, classroom-based learning, um, whether that's for children or for adults. Um, you can't just tell people to kind of increase people's knowledge and expect their attitudes to change. You need to give them the experience of interacting with somebody who has, you know, any kind of disability or difference. And so that would be the thing, I think, that's crucial in changing children's attitudes. You know, opportunities in school to, you know, be alongside other children with difference to experience things, working on things together in a productive way, that tends to shift attitudes. And if we replicate that um, upwards, then you know, older children and young people need to do that, but adults need to have that um, opportunity as well. And it's, it's been done very successfully, I think, in the field of mental health, where awareness raising has worked quite well, I think, across different populations across the world, Often that's done by somebody who identifies with a mental health difficulty, you know, presenting information, giving training themselves and interacting with people. And I think if we replicate that um, with training that's led by autistic people, for example, in this context, then that would be a way to make that change across society. Pues, pues ya no vamos a tener más tiempo para más preguntas. Yo... Pues, pues podríamos seguir aquí comentando y hablando sobre este tema tan interesante como es el de la familia, el bienestar de la familia. Y, y nada, pues agradecerte, Richard, el que hayas venido aquí a aceptar la invitación de Tati.
que para nosotros era muy importante también que vinieras y muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. Gracias.